Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Joseph Johnson will defend the academic thesis, a comprehensive study on the cognitive mechanisms on neural substrates of hallucination proneness. Dear candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Okay, good afternoon. I would like to thank the guests, supervisors, and members of the committee for taking part in this defense of my doctoral dissertation on the cognitive mechanisms and neural substrates of hallucination proneness. It's my pleasure to begin by walking you through uh, the general background and specific studies, as well as the overall findings that I propose. The core of this research revolves around the concept of false perceptions. Simply put, these are things that we perceive in the absence of the corresponding sensory data. An example of, of this, uh, of par particular interest to my research, is hearing voices when no one is speaking to you, also known as auditory verbal hallucinations. Hallucinations are also reported visually, like seeing a spider crawling in the dark when you're alone, as touch, like feeling your phone vibrate when no one is calling, or even a smell, like catching the scent of fire when luckily nothing is burning. Perhaps most often, people associate these false perceptions with mental illness, although these are key symptoms in schizophrenia, <clears throat> particularly hearing voices, hallucinations are also reported in other diagnosable disorders. But importantly, they're also reported across the general population. Psychosis-like experience can occur in many people, but again, most often is hearing voices. Importantly, the presence of these experiences across the population has led to a shift in perspective away from a categorical approach to a continuum of psychosis. In line with the continuum perspective, I focus the current research on the concept of hallucination proneness. Using the Lonnie Slade hallucination scale, <clears throat> one can measure how much an individual is affected by hallucinations and related false perceptions. By employing a five-point scale asking, to what extent does this statement apply to you? 16 items are presented related to hallucinations of different sensory modalities or vivid thoughts and daydreaming as similar yet unexplicit experiences uh, um, similar to true hallucinations and sleep-related hallucinations that occur when one is tired, like finding a ghostly figure at the end of your bed when you're half asleep. This means for, for those who do not or have not ever hallucinated, we can still measure your proneness to hallucination as an indication to have these experiences in the future. The first motivation of this dissertation was to investigate the mechanism most associated with hallucinations, where self-directed um, uh, false perceptions are driven by a mix-up of signals uh, of our own making and their externalization to another source. Importantly, this suggests that false perceptions seen across the population are the cause of erroneous function of the same mechanism serving our normal, more tr uh, trustworthy perceptions. To form our perceptions, we constantly must predict the most likely causes of the sensory information that we, that we observe, in, particularly, uh, in particular to the context that we are in. For example, if we approach things like, shaped like trees in a forest, we see trees. However, our ability to predict also allows us to know if what we perceive is the result of our own action, the environment, or somebody else through the mechanism of sensory motor feedback processing. For example, when exercising vocal control in a noisy room, we must repeatedly determine, uh, we must, uh, repeatedly determine and adapt our production to be heard at an appropriate level. This is done by sending forward a prediction of our expected or desired feedback to compare with actual feedback and make necessary adjustments based on the degree of error signaled back. This, univer uh, this mechanism is universal, universal and is similarly applied in things like learning to shoot a bow on a windy day. An additional function comes out of this process where we can determine if someone else has taken control. Most people know the feeling when playing a video game and realizing you'd accidentally been watching the other person's screen. 
A second motivation in this research was to focus on a part of the brain essential to feedback processing and has been linked to the presence of hallucinations, the cerebellum. And finally, <clears throat> as temporal voice areas become erroneously active during auditory verbal hallucinations, the research was motivated to uncover how mechanisms of voice identity processing are represented in these regions and how their function may relate to hallucination proneness. <clears throat> Four studies were carried out to explore these matters. Focusing on mechanisms of feedback error processing, hypersensitivity, self and other voice identity processing, and the structural changes specific to brain connections in hallucination proneness. The first step was to outline how different regions of this feedback error processing system are represented uh, as a consensus across functional neuroimaging research. To do so, I conducted a meta-analysis where data was collected from all studies in healthy people where this mechanism was probed. Uh, an activation likelihood estimate analysis was used, which indicates which regions across the included research are most likely to overlap and therefore show consensus. These studies either manipulated um, vocally produced auditory feedback or manually produced visual feedback. <clears throat> um, for example, you're holding a certain note with your voice and unexpectedly the pitch feedback is shifted by the experimenter. Particularly interesting for me in terms of a possible link to hearing voices. Or visual studies where you may be controlling the movement of an avatar on a screen with a joystick and suddenly there's a spatial shift in feedback or perhaps the, introduce, the introduction of a brief time delay. In each auditory, visual, and in combination, a separate meta-analysis was conducted to determine regions specifically involved in error for one sensory modality or uh, modality general. For auditory tasks, an increase in activity was shown in areas involved in hearing, specifically auditory objects like voice. And for visual tasks, those uh, in those um, regions involved in vision were probed, including those involved in seeing the movement of body parts. And in total, the increase in activity in regions associated with monitoring error in general. Therefore, there is indeed a presence of modality-specific activations. Finally, I conducted a separate analysis to determine how the cerebellum, a key region of feedback error processing, is probed by this type of research and found that specifically studies where error was sustained reported activations, possibly due to an elicitation of an adaptation to the error. <clears throat> In all, the main takeaways were that there are indeed regions of the system there that are modality specific and modality general, and that certain regions like the cerebellum respond differently to simply responding to error versus having to adapt. Second, I wanted to know if before the point of production, a predisposition to abnormal perception may already be affected in hallucination proneness. Using an fMRI task uh, to localize the regions preferential to voice, um, this was done by comparing responses to speech and non-speech voice sounds and environmental and man-made non-voice sounds. This task generally and here revealed three patches in either temporal lobe more responsive to voice. When correlating to the hallucination proneness scores of each participant, only the right posterior region showed a positive relationship. Among the temporal voice areas, this specific spot is early in a hierarchy of speaker related features in voice processing. Importantly, this could imply that prior to abnormal feedback processing, the hallucination prone brain is already biased to hearing voice sounds. This may be important in these regions becoming active during hallucinations that could be even caused simply by inner speech signals. In summary, there appears to be a bias in voice perception of the hallucination prone brain. Third, since auditory verbal hallucinations involve perceiving a voice as another person, I wanted to know how the feedback error processing may relate to the ownership or externalization of one's own voice. 
First, outside the scanner, a novel task was used. On some trials, participants would passively hear voices. And on other trials, they had to press a button to elicit the voice sound. On each trial, they're asked if they believed that it sounded more like them or somebody else. The voice sounds were created from recordings of their own voice and an unfamiliar person and were morphed along a continuum to create the level of uncertainty. From this behavioral task, I could determine the point of morphing where they were most uncertain. Then in the scanner, they completed a similar task with no decision component with conditions of passive hearing and active button press where voices could be only self, other, or this point of maximum uncertainty. Regions of interest were selected using the same temporal voice area localizer study from uh, um, localizer task from study two. We isolated an anterior region associated with voice identity. From the meta-analysis in study one, we selected the inferior frontal region involved in general error monitoring. In the voice identity region, the active condition showed less showed less activity compared to um, passive hearing of one's own voice, but not for other or uncertain voices. Meaning, activity in this part of the brain is suppressed when hearing one's own voice during action. In the error region, however, there was no activation during the passive condition as, as expected, and responses to hearing other people's voice during action was increased highlighting an error response. In, sum, in summary, I report a suppression of one's own voice, which importantly can occur without vocal production. This is crucial as it may allow for future research to study these responses without the introdu introduction of biases from vocal production. For example, head movement in the scanner caused by speaking. In the final study, I investigated how hallucination proneness may relate to changes in the structure of the brain, in particular, pathways associated with the mechanisms of prediction and feedback processing. The bundles of brain cells that connect, that connect the brain together make up a tissue called white matter, something like train tracks bringing information to distant stations. In terms of fi findings on white matter changes associated with hallucinations, these are mostly reported in schizophrenia patients. This gives a particular difficulty in the interpretation. The schizophrenia has been known as a disconnection, disconnection syndrome, yet hallucination severity often correlates to increases in the directionality of white matter. So here I look at a healthy sample to see if the hallucination proneness relationship is comparable to increases with hallucination severity, or perhaps to the progressive decreases that um, might indicate a link to disorder. For this analysis, I s selected specific white matter pathways involved in speech, salience monitoring, and between the hemispheres associated with mechanisms um, for the emergence of hallucinations. Also, I modeled the tracks of pathways carrying predictive signals to the cerebellum and the air information sent back to the motor cortex when needing to adapt to investigate structural changes of the feedback mechanism in hallucination proneness. Um, two measures are used generally in, in the DTI research that we did. The first being a measure of the directionality of the pathways. Uh, this is accomplished by modeling the diffusion of the water along it. So you can kind of see the direction that the pathway is going and how tight this is. Um, second, uh, the counting of streamlines from one region to another can be taken as a measure of connectivity. So quite literally the amount of um, pathways that are modeled between two areas. Uh, an increase in directionality was found in relation to hallucination proneness in each of the pathways, but only in the right hemisphere, possibly indicating a reflection of a lateralized salience response. The uh, salience network, sorry. The number of streamlines in the pathway from the left cerebellum to the right primary motor cortex correlated with hallucination proneness possibly a reflection, uh, possibly related to abnormal feedback processing. In all, we can conclude that structural brain changes do exist in relation to hallucination proneness in a way that compares to increases seen in increasing symptom severity of clinical groups. So in relation to my original motivations, I suggest a set of integrated findings regarding sensory motor feedback processing, cerebellum, and temporal voice areas. 
First, I found a region responsive to modality general feedback error, which not only responded to externalized voice, but also may be a part of a salience network served by white matter pathways in hallucination proneness. I suggest future, future research investigates how a salience bias detected in this region may respond during hallucinations explicitly, but also how a modality general salience bias may be the common point of abnormal function related to false perceptions in both clinical and non-clinical groups. Second, although the cerebellum has been linked to uh, hallucinatory experiences, both observationally and mechanistically, it is a current focus in this research to isolate the point of, uh, it's a current uh, focus across all research right now to isolate the point where this function is, is uh, abnormal within this network. So evidently, we indicate the point of abnormal structure to be uh, in our data for the pathway returning the air information back to the cortex involved in adaptation responses. Um, we also show that it's possible to study this further using fMRI and adaptation paradigms. Future research could apply fMRI fMRI adaptation paradigms in relation to hallucination proneness to characterize the abnormal cerebellar function, and ultimately, if large differences in cerebellar error signaling could link this region to externalization of feedback, like in hallucinations. And finally, I suggest that from the <laughs> included temporal voice area research, we show an important distinction of the points in hierarchical voice processing where proneness is linked. Although an internalization or externalization of voice identity occurs further down in the hierarchy, as we showed, the hallucination proneness hypersensitivity happens much earlier in the voice processing hierarchy. <clears throat> this begs the question, does early hypersensitivity to um, hypersensitivity influence voice identity attribution in cases of externalization, or are they downstream of different processes. For example, does a salience bias influence only perception, or do other mechanisms like cognitive control allow for the preservation of self-identification? I would like to end with a brief yet important set of societal implications. Here I demonstrate that hallucination proneness links to both functional and structural changes to, otherwise, to the otherwise healthy brain, lending evidence to a continuum theory. An understanding that this variability exists in the brain across the population can hopefully contribute to a destigmatization of the presence of false perceptions like hallucinations, where people may feel more comfortable speaking about them. A proneness persistence impairment model suggests that identifying people who are prone is a key point in avoiding the development of frequent psychosis-like experiences and eventually clinical disorder. Therefore, destigmatization could assist in promoting help seeking behavior for those in need. With that, I would like to give the word back to the pro rector and thank you all for your time and interest. Thank you, Kenny, for this clear presentation. A bit, little bit longer than expected, but um, we will continue with questioning now. As um, the position will be opened by Professor Dr. Bernard Jansma, who is a full professor at the Maastricht University and Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience of Language. She was the chair of the assessment committee. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidate, first uh, let me uh, congratulate you to this achievement. I read your thesis with great interest and also learned a lot already. Congratulations also go to the supervisors here and also online. I think Anna is there. Um, so and actually very nice is that you have published already quite some uh, chapters of the work that's not so usual anymore, so you can be very proud of that. Uh, and of course my job is to uh, ask some questions and I would like to relate my questions to your chapter four, which is the fMRI study. Um, you mentioned in the preparation of the stimuli that you use the straight algorithm uh, mm which is a tool somewhere in MATLAB, but you don't give any details of actually what this tool does in morphing the stimuli. Could you explain to me a little bit about that? Because that might guide to the next questions. Then. Uh, my highly esteemed colleague, thank you for the kind words and your question. So uh, in the preparation of the stimuli for this fMRI task, 
uh, we didn't use uh, we, we did indeed use a voice morphing software that is actually quite more complex than what we used it for because we were essentially using very very simple vowel stimuli that uh, were also um, normalized to the same duration. So this software actually is able to take continuous speech excerpts uh, that have different um, uh, changing in terms of the timing of different um, punctuations, for example, or um, different uh, fundamental frequencies or um, of the person's voice that you're morphing to and from. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, essentially um, using a matrix to um, tie together different aspects of speech in terms of their timing and the actual pitch of the voices. Um, and uh, we, in particular, uh, for the methods of the study, didn't go too deep into that because having um, stimuli that were already quite normalized, mm -hmm. uh, the matrix was just uh, um, quite simply. Okay, but that, do I get that in the, like in the different conditions of the self-voice, the uncertainty and the others, you modulate and then especially in the F0, like the base formant, uh, or also in the F1, F2, which might be very relevant for the vowels, which mm. you use, right? And uh, that's your vowel. Um, yeah, so it actually takes, it takes the fundamental frequency, but it also takes the F1 and F2, I believe, but um, uh, this is quite automatized, so it's, it's, it determines how it's going to anchor these in the matrix. Okay. So, uh, no, I'm, and I'm just asking because probably it's good to understand what the um, acoustic features then are after the morphing procedure to probably look uh, into the data in, in more detail. And if I have time, I come to that. But first, I would like to... Yeah ask you something general. You also clearly showed uh, or demonstrated that you had a pre-specified region of interest. Uh, that's this anterior STG. Yes. And you also then found this uh, result in the ASC, which is in figure four in the panel A. Yeah. Right? But you refer to the um, McGuinness idea of this hierarchical uh, processing, and you say that, like in, in posterior, you have acoustics, in mid, you have more um, uh, prototypes, and in identity recognition, uh, that, that would be your target region. So now I wonder, you looked into that for good reasons, and only into this one region, but knowing all this background, did you look also into the other regions and did you find uh, motor-induced suppression there as well? Um, with the region of interest study, we, we did not look at, uh, specifically into those, into the, into the other um, regions that were uh, produced from the localizer. We kind of did it in a, um, a, a progressive way with the previous study where mm -hmm. we had that data that determined which regions were uh, sensitive to hallucination proneness, which showed any sort of correlation um, uh, to determine for this study, for example, if we were going to be um, requiring to look into such a covariate. But essentially, all we did uh, was, uh, in a very a priori way, um, want to look at uh, this uh, self versus other um, uh, differential processing, which is um, I think uh, the le according to the McGinnis theory, the uh, posterior to anterior gradient, the decision making at that point is um, kind of referring more to um, a norm based encoding that is going to be um, uh, for self voice, the most normal voice per se for your brain because you hear it the most often. And so we really focused our hypotheses just on just on looking at how that would have an effect um, in terms of expectancy. And so I think it would be quite interesting now that we've gotten these two different findings about the um, the different levels of hierarchical processing, how they related to hallucination proneness, but also to this mechanism of externalization and seeing altogether perhaps how they might respond to maybe even progressive losses of self-identity in the voice, which we weren't, for um, quite practical reasons, uh, able to do in the current study. Uh, we had to reduce, uh, in order to get enough trials in the fMRI, we had to reduce to just self-uncertain and other.
Oh. Um, but I think that would be an interesting yeah. thing to look at in the okay. future. Thanks. Given the time, uh, do I have another? If it's short. Yeah. So because like still I'm I'm nagging there. Uh, because there is an alteration in the acoustic input, right? And mm -hmm. whenever there is an uh, alteration in the acoustic input, uh, you nicely explain the forward model, then you would expect some sort of uh, suppressive effect. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah, what would you expect for these two other areas given the manipulation you did with your str uh, straight algorithm? Okay, give so a short answer. Short answer. Um, so the, this form of suppression for self-other, I think, was quite specific to our ROI. And I think that a general suppression for just playing a noise with a button would, would probably be appearing at a different level of the hierarchy. Um, but uh, at the point that we looked at, um, we would not observe a general suppression there. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Kenneth J. Hoogdal, Professor Emeritus uh, from the University of Bergen. Um, he is professor in the field of biological psychology, and he was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you. And uh, let me first. Uh, uh, thank the university for the kind invitation to read the thesis, which I very much enjoyed, and also to be uh, taking part of the assessment and, and also of this uh, uh, ceremony here today. Uh, my first question relates to uh, the concept of hallucinatory proneness that you are kind of using, and you're using the Lone Slade questionnaire, which is a very commonly used uh, questionnaire to kind of uh, screen people to the degree of their proneness for hallucinations. Now, in there is the concept of the state trait, which you may be familiar with. A trait concept of the, of the mental phenomenon is a a tendency for a characteristic which may or may not be present. That characteristic may or may not be present at the time of measurement or at the time of evaluation. Uh, the state uh, uh, of a characteristic is that it is present at that time of my measurement. So as I understand that the, the lower slate is a, it is a straight measure. So your subjects, and that is implied in the proneness uh, concept in, in itself. Uh, how, how do you know that some of your, of your subjects may have experienced hallucinations while they were in the scanner and some may not? And the reason I ask that is because we know that a state characteristic while being scanned could have a kind of interference effect of what you are measuring that a trait phenomenon uh, or a characteristic would not. So how, how do you know that you're not kind of confounding uh, in a way your findings uh, with uh, not knowing whether you had trait state uh, or which were which one in your sample? Thank you, uh, my highly esteemed opposition. Thank you for the kind words and the question. Um, I think that's actually a really important point that I try to, to make clear with the use of the Lonnie Slate hallucination scale is that it's not, it's not going to be um, giving you much other than um, a trait of proneness and cannot really be directly related to the presence of hallucinations, uh, especially um, in terms of... Uh, the sample that we had. We had nobody report uh, having explicit hallucinations uh, as a trait. Um, I can't rule out that they had their first uh, hallucinatory experience while they were in the scanner. Uh, however, I do understand the concept of uh, interference that, that would be had on these results uh, as uh, essentially the hallucinated uh, um, perception in the scanner 
um, takes the resources, I guess, of the of, of the auditory processing and uh, creates an opposite response to the um, to the stimuli used in the experiment. Um, we also did not, uh, or at least I did not find uh, individual data sets with uh, completely um, opposite um, activations that would be characteristic of this interference of having a hallucination uh, in the scanner. Um, but uh, I suppose uh, in future research, I'm, I'm probably going to ask explicitly every single participant if they hallucinated while in the scanner. Um, I hope that is this. Yeah. 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 Because I, I also think that this is irrelevant for the, the question of the relevance of findings in, uh, in individuals that are prone for hallucination for what we may be after in the long run. And that is understanding and treating hallucinations that are clinically relevant because they are the, are the phenomena really handicapping and causing a disadvantage for individuals. Uh, so this is really important issue in order to bridge from the non-clinical over to the clinical hallucinations. Do you have any? Yeah, so um, I think one of the um, main points that I raise in the discussion is how relatable this proneness can be to um, what we find in, in clinical hallucinators. And um, I believe that ideologically there's probably or quite certainly different reasons why people with certain disorders like schizophrenia would result in having hallucinations. However, um, somewhere down the, the chain, there's likely a result of uh, an increase in, um, in dopamine that is causing this. And I think that for the clinical groups such as schizophrenia that uh, have uh, hypofunction in the NMDAR receptor on the GABA, um, I think that uh, this could be something that we're not observing really as the cause in, um, of non-clinical hallucinations. But to me, it's more about um, characterizing uh, this phenomenology of, of proneness because, yes, there might be people that are going to have um, uh, false perceptions throughout their life quite, quite often for different, for different reasons, but to identify those who are prone that are um, beginning to, according to the proneness um, persistence impairment model, have persistent false perceptions, then they are of, of a large interest. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's not a matter of these being a spectrum of the same thing, but more um, our ability to um, find those who are at risk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I like that last answer you gave in particular. Uh, I don't think myself either that we may be talking about the same thing on just a single dimension. That's probably too simple uh, between the non-clinical to, to the clinical. And, uh, and also, uh, I think I have one minute left. For, for hallucinatory phenomenon. And uh, you were, were alluding to here that maybe future research could go into looking at the, uh, a level below the, the functional imaging level, and that would be into the neurochemistry. And uh, do you have any idea how you could perhaps uh, approach that with, uh, with uh, the MR technology, for example, MR spectroscopy or something like that, in order to really get down to the level below where you are right now? So you have about 30 seconds to answer. Uh, so the next project that I will be working on is actually about characterizing uses MR technology glutamate levels and also using um, uh, nodi uh, diffusion uh, imaging to characterize if there is actual changes to, uh, to the myelination. Thank you. Uh, that concludes <laughs> 
Thank you very much. We will continue with another Norwegian member of the committee, uh, Dr. Torger Morbergat, who is um, at the University of Oslo. Uh, he's an adjunct associate professor at the Norwegian Center for Mental Disorders Research. And he was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you, University, um, for giving me the opportunity to, 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 to read this thesis and to thank the candidate for, for writing um, a very clear and, and concise thesis, I think. I really, really enjoyed the introduction and the, some of the background on, on the theory. Um, and I'm also a cerebellar aficionado, so uh, I, I really enjoy meeting other, other um, enthusiasts. Um, Another thing that, that really struck me with this thesis is that you've, uh, you've used a wide range of methods or methodological approaches. So you're combining not only uh, sort of within subjects experiments, but you're also uh, looking at, um, at um, across uh, individual differences. Um, and so these different approaches come with their pros and cons, um, I guess. And so there's uh, it's always a sort of a trade-off between having great experimental control or having a, a large sample uh, or several studies as you did in a meta-analysis, but then you don't actually know exactly what they did. Um, so I'd like, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on that. So if you can take some of the, some of the conclusions from your studies and try to assign a bit of um, certainty to them. So which of your findings are you very sure of? Which are you might be true, might not be replicated. Uh, I'd like you to, to think a little bit about that. So which, where would you really put your money uh, on, on the things that you've, um, you've found in this PhD thesis? Um, my esteemed opposition, thank you for the kind words and the question. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, as a relatively new MRI researcher as I began the PhD. I was very interested in expanding my method set, but at the same time, uh, we intended to focus our research on the non-clinical brain. And this was the primary reason for using within subjects uh, designs because we just weren't really ready yet. Um, we didn't have the basis yet to start comparing to the clinical um, groups. Um, so the, the decision was based on this, but it also allowed us to increase our sample size for some of the studies quite high. Uh, for example, if I were to be putting my money where my mouth is, uh, the DTI findings with uh, um, over 50 participants uh, characterizing a pretty, a pretty um, strong correlation to changes to, to uh, fractional anisotropy and a pretty clear pattern that these were um, uh, kind of uh, stronger in the right hemisphere. I think that uh, this was just a, a, a study with a large enough power and a clear enough um, analysis that this, this, this replication I would, I would expect to be occurring at all times. Well, not at all times, but <laughs> often. Uh, and uh, as far as the, the problems that, that we kind of uh, occurred using all these different methods was, um, for example, I mentioned pr before, um, uh, complex design on study, on the third study with uh, the two by three factorial design um, was very difficult to, um, to make sure that we were going to get enough um, trials to run this analysis. Uh, and so essentially uh, a large issue here was that um, we had a very, delayed um, uh, uh, acquisition for every trial so that we could present the sounds during a silence and uh, or a relative silence. And this ended up as uh, maybe more of the difficult data sets to, to go through because we probably ended up with just, just enough trials to run the analysis. So I think that that's the kind of research that I would suggest people to look further into. Um, but the findings were relatively strong, so I think something is there. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure, so I just I'm sure I'm not the only one, but just um, a lot of people uh, have been um, discussing this paper by Marek et al. that came out uh, in 
this year uh, with the somewhat um, depressing title, uh, Reproducible Brain-Wide Associations Require Thousands of Individuals. Um, so what would be your comment to that? So um, I wouldn't give you them. But it's enough. I I agree with that point. Fifty is a lot for a DTI study of this type, but uh, as far as running, you know, sufficient power analyses and in in, um, in MRI, it it you're always going to be limited by the money, uh, and uh, I think we were quite fortunate to get what we did. But at the same time, I'm a very large fan of the 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 expansion of um, open data sets um, and projects that are congregating the, these these data into pools that researchers can use uh, can access. Um, but also, I plan uh, in the future to continue running meta analyses because I thought that as the first uh, um, analysis that I did in this PhD. It was quite enlightening to see that uh, we actually didn't know that consensus yet. I, I just kind of would have assumed we knew what areas were involved, but it uh, took the compilation of, of, uh, of many studies um, to see that indeed um, there was a lot of noise over the, over the literature. There was a lot of uh, un, unreplicated results, um, but there was still something there. So I'm still going to continue. Uh, applying. Um, in particular, I'm quite fond of uh, Ginger Ale because they also have open data sets that, that, they can, that you can use their software, their additional software to search. So I, I do agree that it is an issue in the fields, but I think that uh, the way that things are going, we can take advantage of uh, getting access to these thousands of data points. Thank you, and I really like the, um, the addition of, um, of, um, of a meta-analysis in the, in the thesis. I think that should, um, having that as a first point in the PhD education, I think is, is a very good idea. Um, it gives you, as you said, an overview of the uncertainty of the field. Um, if I have time for one more, uh, uh, then... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. I thought you already continued, but uh, please go ahead for a short question. Oh, wonderful. Um, it might not be very short. Uh, we'll, we'll go for it anyway. Uh, you imply in the first paper that from bold fMRI might not be the tool for studying cerebellar function. What other tools would you uh, suggest? What would you do? If you, if you were to uh, address that question again, what tools would you really want to have at your disposal? I think that you would need to increase the temporal resolution in terms of these brief cerebellar responses, but at the same time, uh, these 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 changes in in, in activation um, revolving around the the parallel fiber Purkinje cell synapse and these quick changes to the spontaneous activity to the to the coordinated activity that 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 can create long term depression, long term. Um, uh, uh, changes to the brain, I think you can also look at in, in, in um, longer term studies. So I don't think that these need to be looking at specific activations on how they're affecting the cerebellum, but uh, maybe coordination paradigms, learning skills, and seeing over that time how things change. Um, but I also do think that this ability for us to um, only be able, I think, of course, that the cerebellum is involved in these potentiated changes to, to feedback, um, uh, but our ability to only see this in the adaptation studies um, is telling that, that, that um, indeed um, there is a difference in, in the activation based on how long you're going, if you have to adapt or not, how long you have to um, uh, deal with the continuous feedback. So I think that actually probably more research should go into determining um, these thresholds of what it takes to actually cause a sustained change. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Federico De Martino, who is a full professor at the Maastricht University, Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience. He is professor in the sensory circuits, sensory circuits and neuroimaging. Yes, dear candidate, uh, first of all, let me congratulate you and all the team that, that uh, with you um, um, conducted this wonderful research. 
I read the thesis, I am a recent aficionado of predictive coding and I realized I have learned a lot and I have a lot to learn still because uh, many things that are in here uh, are really inspiring also for my research that is not to do with uh, hallucinations but mostly with predictions in uh, sensory input. Now, of course, because this is very close to what I like, I have a lot of questions, but I was inspired by the previous question about reproducibility and effect sizes. I know this is a big thing, so I'm going to change my questions now. <laughs> and I'm going to challenge the idea that we need to have a thousand people in fMRI scanners, uh, scans, but uh, at least, at least when, not when we are doing genetics associations. Of course, that's, that's a different thing, but if we are looking at what uh, we generally look in uh, experimental psychology uh, type of, of cognitive neuroscience, I think we don't need that, that kind of numbers. We just need to have careful methods, careful descriptions of what we have done and avoiding of problems. And so I am now going to your chapter three in which uh, you are uh, looking at hypersensitivity to passive voice hearing in hallucination proneness. And uh, the way you do this is you have a localizer uh, where it was it? Um, maybe it was not this was the previous one. Where the one in which you are? Oh no, I think it's this one. You have a localizer, and it's like the classical voice localizer. You localize your regions of interest uh, by doing the contrast, and then you take uh, the response to the same data for voices and non-voices, and you run an another analysis on the regions that have been defined on the same data already. Now, uh, there is a, lot, a large body of literature, apart from uh, early or late papers on sensational things about how fMRI is not great, that says that double dipping is really, really dangerous because it makes your data completely not reproducible. So um, I'm asking you, how concerned are you about the fact that something like that could have happened? And if that's the case, then how would you change your analysis? as you can't change the data. The data are there. So the data are open access, hopefully. And let's say I can go there and analyze them again. How would you suggest me to analyze them again? Uh, my highly esteemed uh, opponent, thank you for the kind words in your question. Uh, I think that, indeed, um, that was a decision that we took with caution to run, to use the localizer data as its own um, as his own experimental data in terms of the contrast. Uh, I think if we were to do it again, uh, we, you could probably quite simply um, uh, use the regions of interest from the consensus uh, coordinates that are taken and not double dip and simply just see how these activations are relating to hallucination proneness. The reason that we actually wanted to do this with the task uh, and not simply use the task to localize and look at some other um, secondary data set within these regions of interest. Actually quite interested in how this broadly used temporal voice area localizer might actually have variability within it. Because if it's being used across the general population in many different studies, and there is a covariate that is quite important that is driving the, 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 the strength of the activations, we, we wanted to know. Um, so I think that uh, we did get valuable uh, data out of this, but the, the risk of uh, double dipping, I think, is, is real. And maybe I, sorry, maybe if I just can interrupt. So in the literature of machine learning and decoding, then they propose that there is a solution for this. You don't have to go to your meta-analysis, mm -hmm. just cross-validation. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think that would work on your data? So do you have enough data to do that? That, for example, you could mm -hmm. use half of the data to localize your regions or quarter because these voice responses, categorical voice responses are very strong. So I don't think you need that much data to actually get your ROIs and then test your hypothesis in the remaining set. Uh, we considered using um, multivoxel pattern analysis for this uh, and looked into using um, machine learning on this data set. But the thing was that we had 20 trials of each, and this was uh, advised as not going to be enough to separate into a training set uh, and still run meaningful analyses on it. Um, this was the same issue that we ran into for the other study we considered running uh, um, these um, 
uh, using these techniques, but once again, we were already playing with the minimum trials that we could for what we needed. So we decided to go for the, this is the reason we went for the region of interest technique was because of this trial amount and uh, to leave the uh, MVPAs behind for now. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears. If I have a bit of time, I'm gonna just ask another question. I'm gonna move on to the next chapter where you are actually uh, looking at a very interesting thing. So you are uh, morphing on voices into other voices and you're looking at these uh, correlates with respect to whether you hear these voices in association to a bottom press or not. Um, and you talk about expectancy of own voice. Now, I understand that, yes, we expect our voice more because we tend to hear ourselves more, I suppose, especially me, I talk a lot. But um, in your task, uh, people don't learn to expect their voice in, us, in relationship to the button press because they, every time they press a button, they hear equally probably their voice, another person's voice, or a morph somewhere in between. So what, what would change if you would actually add that level of expectancy, which has been done, for example, for the tone uh, type of paradigms, also in animals where people, where, where, where these kind of things have been done to look at the motor auditory associations. Why, why didn't you do this? Um, so essentially we are trying to build on the tone expectancy research and see if, and to explicitly see if it uh, related to, um, was applicable to expectancy and voice. And this was a major um, uh, concept for me to rationalize myself because essentially the, the motor signals that you're sending from the button press aren't corresponding to voice feedback quality per se. But uh, I think that the, the debate, you mentioned predictive coding already, I think that the debate that people are having on the influence of pre or the, the use of predictive coding as a model for um, uh, for hallucinations uh, versus the sensory motor feedback um, cerebellar uh, predictive uh, cycle. I think these interact in my opinion. Uh, I truly think that the way forward is to not consider these two different predictive machines, but instead a cortical way of knowing how to expect um, uh, uh, qualities of, of, of stimuli in general that interacts with the signals regarding ownership of action. So I think if you want to think of it uh, this way, instead of um, considering it particularly the same as uh, vocal production feedback, just having a, a button press instead of speaking, I think it's more like the, um, the processing of the expected feedback of uh, expected sound of your own voice during action in general. So um, this is to me more similar to the tone concept, um, but not requiring actual um, motor production uh, signals from um, uh, vocalization regions. So I, I think they're just interacting sim uh, I systems. I hope this answer is sufficient because we have to move on to the yeah. next. <laughs> Okay, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Vincent van der Ven, who is associate professor at the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience of the Maastricht University. Thank you. Um, dear candidate, also my congrats on a very nice thesis. Um, I am currently doing different type of research, but my background is also in hallucinations and hallucination proneness. So I was very happy to, uh, to be able to read um, your work on this. And it's very exciting and very interesting to see a large variety of, of uh, of methodologies that you applied. I also notice a large variety in terminology. So there is uh, adaptation, and there is expectation and prediction or prediction error. Uh, there's talk about self-monitoring. And all of these terms are interrelated. And uh, all of them have been mentioned or described in hallucination research at some point. But I was wondering what your take really is uh, on this. Um, so for example, in, in chapter two, you talk about adaptation in the auditory cortex being a very important factor in explaining whether or not you find cerebellar better uh, activity in the meta-analysis. But this same pattern of, of, uh, of, uh, of differences in activity, uh, you refer to as self-monitoring uh, and expectancy in chapter four. So first of all, can you explain a bit on how you think these terms are related uh, in your thesis? And secondly, if there is time, uh, what would be the role of these 
um, uh, these factors in actually hearing hallucinations. <coughs> uh, my esteemed opposition, thank you for your kind words and question. Uh, I believe that um, parcelating this terminology was a difficulty for me um, because of the broadness of the, the methodologies we used. And um, I found it difficult and I, I thought I had rationalized it, it uh, well enough in the, uh, how I used it in the um, introduction and discussion. But indeed, in the, in the published studies, if I'm uh, working, for example, with um, uh, voice quality in the, in the, sorry, voice identity in the temporal, um, uh, superior temporal gyrus, uh, these decisions are referred to in that literature as based on expectancy in terms of the, um, the uh, oh sorry, in terms of uh, um, uh, how much they deviate from the prototype. Uh, and then with, when I move, for example, to a sensory motor um, paradigm, when we're talking about the, the sensory motor control cerebellar loops, um, these are viewed as... Uh, particularly predictive signals. And so essentially the brain, I think, is getting ready in different ways to process feedback based on what you think is coming. But in terms of prediction or expectation, I think that there, I did not intend to use them interchangeably. I was hoping at least that uh, they were clearly going to be separate, but I think that's a problem I, I guess I couldn't resolve. Um, I think that uh, in ter if I'm to use these terms Specifically for the hallucination theories, um, I would use them for different uh, explanations of how hallucinations even emerge. So I think that during the sensory motor um, uh, misattribution of self-generated feedback, I think that you are not probably integrating that prediction signal correctly into your cerebellar processing. However, I think that if people have false perceptions that are purely perceptual, which, which can occur, this is probably because they are expecting the sensory causes. They're, they're, they're sensing what they expect. So I think in the discussion, I tried to differentiate between how these are, these are kind of two different ways that we can see hallucinations may emerge. But at the same time, I don't want to say that one or the other is correct. And I think that could result in using these two ter terminologies at the same time. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, there is an open debate still, I guess, on, on, on the various uh, levels. These, 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 these things could play out. But for example, in, the, uh, in chapter two, we discuss, or you discuss, um, uh, a number of studies. Um, that are associated to actually uh, speech production, whereas in uh, in chapter four uh, they press a button and then hear well, their own voice or a morph voice of this. Mm -hmm. um, in one case, you could talk about say self monitoring, where you have a prediction of of how your own voice should should look like, and then you hear what actually comes out. But in uh, in study four, this doesn't seem to be a case. Nevertheless, we find a similar type of 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 pattern. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's it's. Um, so what do you think of this? It uh, study for, as in the um, fMRI? Yes. Or, yeah, yes. Or chapter, okay. chapter four, sorry. Ch chapter four. Chapter four, yes. okay. Um, uh, so essentially, um, uh, Bob, sorry, I have to, I think I've lost the, the train of this now. So, um, the, uh, the, so I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that the uh, findings are, in a way similar, but the situations mm -hmm. are very different. Uh, I see. Okay. So the meta-analysis and, and yes. this button press thing. Yes. Yeah. So the meta-analysis, as you mentioned, are like primarily um, vocal. If it's voice feedback, it's vocal. If it's not voice feedback, it's button press in, in that, pair, in that, um, in that uh, study. And I think that those are um, the button press per se, those studies would be more comparable to the voice identity study in terms of um, the expectation based on the norm-based coding uh, while, while acting. Uh, and, and I would assume that you, you can actually like adapt that. So in the, uh, in the whole concept of how the, the, the adaptation and the cerebellar um, loops are involved in this, I think that the, um, 
the, for example, pressing a, a button and the tone is delayed is, a, is almost a more similar um, mechanism as when playing a button and hearing a voice. So I do try to differentiate those. I, I think that we can study the, ex the expectancy or the externalization of voice signals during action without vocalization. Now we can, we, I think that that study is, is useful in that sense, but it's not going to replace vocalization uh, um, error studies. So I think the results are similar. There is some form of suppression, but those are based on um, unexpected stimuli while you're acting versus um, uh, maybe the cancellation of suppression if there's any sort of unexpected feedback. Okay. Joseph Johnson, the time to defend your thesis has ended. Um, the, the Greek committee will now withdraw to discuss the way and the quality you defended your thesis. And I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations on, and our return to this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream. Problem-based learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the Skills Lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Chemlock campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project. That includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. 
This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get used to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
Joseph Johnson, oh, sorry, yeah, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the way you've defended your thesis. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Kotz is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance to the Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to, vow, to now take the floor. Dear Joe, Dr. Johnson, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Joseph Francois Johnson, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificates signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, not all, unfortunately, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Please talk into the microphone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, on behalf of Anna, Michelle, and Michael, I congratulate you, Caro, and your whole family who may be visiting online to this great scientific achievement. I want to take this special moment and look back on the many years that we have spent and worked together. When I started my new group at Maastricht University in the fall of 2015, I was looking for a research assistant to complement the group of postdocs that had come with me. Joe at the time had just finished his master's degree in cognitive and clinical neuroscience at the Berry University in August of 2015 and was scanning the surroundings for further scientific experience. Not shy to enter Anamis, our soul of the department's office, Joe found out about the new lady on the block who just might have to post a post to fill. And sure enough, Joe walked through my door end of October 2015 and seemed to not have left since then. <laughs> so why and how did Joe become a member of the band lab? There are three points to make. Joe, the thriving scientist. When walking into my office in October 2015, several aspects became clear very quickly. Joe came with excellent recommendations. Esther Coilus, his in internal research supervisor, and Peter Steers, who supervised his research elective, spoke highly of Joe as a person and as a curious mind who could take on a challenge. And Joe came with presence. During our first meeting, we spoke of his scientific endeavors in Clint Humphrey's lab at Oxford, but also two potential projects that he could become engaged in, one on non-motor deficits in Parkinson's disease and one on false auditory perceptions in non-clinical voice hearers. We had a long and good discussion during which Joe was not shy to ask many questions. He shared his thesis work with me and spontaneously decided to join our Monday lab meetings after this initial discussion. The rest is history. Joe was on board. <laughs> Starting as an RA, Joe quickly joined the first project of a new postdoc in the lab, Michelle Bellick. 
on singing and whistling imitation to understand the dynamics of vocal control. To demonstrate Joe's scientific enthusiasm, here's a story that Michelle shared with me and really <laughs> got me to laugh. So this is O-Tone Michelle. When Joe was still an RA, we had him collect, collect data on singing and whistling. Part of the protocol was to have participants do some vocal warm-ups so that we could measure their vocal range. We had them do vocal sweeps up to the top of their range and vocal sweeps to the bottom of their range. As it happens, I guess some of the most, mostly female cohort of participants that we recruited were quite smitten with Joe. When I listened back to the recordings later, it was clear that some were flirting with him quite overtly. <laughs> Joe, of course, remaining strictly serious and professional. We might have been able to cope with this if it had not been for the vocal sweeps. It is hard to flirt while sweeping down to a low, bassy voice, and many of the participants were apparently not keen on it. One I quote as saying, this is as low as my voice goes, Joe. <laughs> it was what clearly was their highest and bubbliest tone. Diligent to the task, Joe would assume, would assure them that it wasn't. <laughs> this work ended up in his first publication. When Lisa and Son, present here as the elves, joined the lab, we started seriously thinking and planning and working on potential precursors of auditory verbal hallucinations in a non-clinical voice hearer population. This project line, initiated by my dear colleague Ana Pinero, first at Braga University and later at University of Lisbon in Portugal, should become Joe's world for the next five years. It was then time to also establish a PhD position for Joe, which Anna and I managed through a fellowship grant of the FCT in Portugal. Quite an adventure, I have to say, getting hired in Braga and then working in Maastricht. So Joe entered a three-year PhD position that was extended by a fourth year of personal funds, which ultimately brings us here today. Together with this incredible team, and I really want to say team, Anna, Zan, Lisa, Michelle, and Michael, Joe developed the structural and functional MRI arm of this multi-methods research line. He programmed, scanned, at the same time motivated, and taught several master students with diligence and dedication. They all came on board willingly, motivated, because Joe is a motivator. He explored and dwelled into new forms of data analysis, always trying to, sorry, solve problems first before knocking on anyone's door. Even though Joe is known at times to go off to the deep end, he is and was always willing to discuss and refocus when needed, while still pursuing some fresh and at times unconventional thought. Almost four publications later, Joe has shown that independent thought and teamwork can be combined to be successful. Well done, Joe. <laughs> Joe the fun and caring person. Joe is simply a fun person to be around with. There's always a friendly smile, a friendly word, and simply an unwavering positive outlook on life. We all know about this and value this trait of Joe. When times got tough scientifically for him or others in the lab, related to some disappointments or another, um, Joe always tried to see the good side of things and pushed forward, never shy of a smile. Personal drama evolved the year before the pandemic and on, onwards, and you with your dear mother becoming rather ill and a lot of uncertainties. Being abroad and trying to support and help is never easy, and it talk, took its toll at times. But Joe would not be Joe if he did not find a way even in these difficult times. Chapeau, Joe. Joe, the socialite and world traveler. Talk about fun. Joe knows how to find a work-life balance. He can be the hit of a party, do we mention Bel Belgian beer? But also knows how to explore the world. I remember talking, uh, Joe talking about trips at the beginning of a week and then they were taking over a weekend, independent how far it took him. And most importantly, always at an incredible good price. Joe knows his internet. <laughs> Joe, this brings you to the end of your time at Maastricht University. We had a great time together, but also shared many of life's ups and downs. Keep up your good spirit, motivation, 
and continue to be open to learn new things that you can enrich with your creative way of thinking. Enjoy your newly married life and your family abroad, but also your new scientific journey with colleagues at Freie Universität Brussels. Best of luck. Do not forget us and check in at times. All the best and congratulations, Dr. Johnson, to you and your family. Let me just finish. On behalf of all four supervisors, I would like to extend our personal gratitude to the chair of the reading committee and its members and to all who prepared this academic session. Your contribution and time are highly appreciated. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Johnson, <laughs> also on behalf of Maastricht University, the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience, but also especially the Department of Neuropsychology and Psychopharmacology, I congratulate you on your degree that you have acquired. And thereby, I close this academic session. <laughs> Having said that, um, we now will be leaving for the rafter for some drinks and to congratulate the new doctor. Yeah. Also, <laughs> busy, busy year. Yeah, yeah. They never tell me at everything. <laughs> the academic session is closed. We can be liberal now. <laughs> um, but we will take some pictures here with the um, members of the um, committee and the supervising team in the back. And then we will shortly meet you in the rafter.